Are you hearing me all right? Okay, here we go. We are started with, I think it said lecture 46. Um, today we're hoping to kind of connect um, sigma notation, the Greek letter S, with this other letter S that's going to basically signify to us that we're going to take an antiderivative. Um, so I was thinking on the way over here today that uh, kind of all the things that I'm going to be doing today. Uh, I had a long day yesterday. Didn't get home till about 10:30. Um, keeping sta I keep stats for the basketball teams, men's and women's basketball teams. Uh, and women had an exhibition game last night. But uh, tonight I'm going to a uh, banquet that is uh, celebrating one of our math professors, uh, Dr. Leroy Martin. Uh, some of you in here might be from Raleigh. There's a Leroy Martin Middle School in Raleigh, and that is named after his father. But he, he is a uh, retiring math professor, and he played on probably the most famous college football team of all time. Not Notre Dame. Uh, it's the only college football team that had two Heisman Trophy winners on the same team. 1945. And uh, they still play football, but they're not like one of the premier football programs in the country. The Army football team, 1945. He was a 19-year-old plebe on that team, Dr. Leroy Martin. Uh, Glenn Davis, does that ring a bell with anybody? He was a Heisman Trophy winner. And um, Doc Blanchard was the other one. They were on the same, two Heisman Trophy winners on the same college football team. Yes. Very, very good. And, and a lot of people, like when somebody has a dynasty going and they talk about Florida doing this or, you know, Florida State doing this and uh, Alabama doing this, they always end up trying to compare them to the 1945 Army team because that's probably the best of all time. But he, he was a player on that team. And we're, our college is uh, having a kind of an awards dinner tonight in his honor. So very deserving, Dr. Leroy Martin. What's that have to do with calculus? I don't know. Probably not very much. So let's get back to um, what it is we're supposed to be doing. So we're going to try to today make the tie from antiderivatives to the uh, area under a curve. which included then in Appendix F, where we use this uh, sigma notation. So we'll try to put all that together today in a section 5.2, kind of logically follows what we've been doing. A little too slowly, actually, for my uh, liking. But we're getting there today. Uh, and we're going to deal with what's called a definite integral. An integral is basically the same as an antiderivative. And a definite integral says we're going to start evaluating it at a certain number. And we'll stop the evaluation at some other number. So it's kind of starting and stopping places. That's what makes it definite as opposed to indefinite. Antiderivatives to this point had a plus C on them. So those are uh, indefinite integrals. But when, when we do a definite integral, we have an answer that's not a function or a whole bunch of functions. It's a number. The answer is a number. And that number will correspond to, guess what, the area under a curve. So we're going to use antiderivatives, definite integrals, to find an area under a curve. So let's um, kind of start with notation. And then we'll try to put all this stuff together that we've accumulated over the last couple days. Another thing I thought about on the way over here, I, um, by the way, if you're always talking to somebody on your cell phone as you're going from one class to another, you kind of lose that thought time, that contemplation time, which is actually pretty helpful sometimes. So at times, you might want to just kind of put your cell phone away and either talk to the human being that you're walking next to. That'd be kind of refreshing. or you might just want to kind of walk by yourself and silently kind of contemplate nature, just things in your life. Um, 
So while I was walking over here today, uh, I did talk to my wife on the cell phone, and then I turned my cell phone off, and I, my mind just goes. I mean, it's limited, very limited, but it does go to its limits uh, nearly every day. So I was thinking of some comments in this class yesterday, and I really thought I probably needed to address them. You said that, um, you know, that web assign, that took me a long time. And that was hard. That, you know, math, math is not supposed to be that way. Math, you're supposed to be able to, you know, here's the formula, plug in the numbers, boom, 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 you're done. I mean, isn't that math? No. That, what you griped about yesterday is, in fact, what most of math is about, is the battle. Just about every professor in our department is a better mathematician than I am. But I think that I'm probably one of the better battlers in the math department because I kind of enjoy the battle a little bit. So I know you're not necessarily going to enjoy it at your age, but uh, keep in mind that math isn't necessarily, you know, five minutes, get a little practice with this function, this formula, and it's over. Math, a lot of times, is the battle, and that's kind of, in my mind, maybe your mind, I don't know, at some point in time, that's the beauty of mathematics, is that you can battle it, and when you start the battle, you may not even know how to start the battle. You just kind of start with something, see if it works, and if it doesn't, change direction. So that's my little parenthetical comment today, is that that's, you know, don't reject that as that's math is horrible, it stinks, takes too long, you know, that's part of it. That's a big part of what I think math is, is taking some time and doing the battle. What's that have to do with today's lesson? Um, again, not a whole lot. So let's start to make this leap from this S, this Greek letter S, which means summation. If we're using, um, and I probably ought to have a diagram here so we can keep track of Let's call this initial x. We'll call it x0. And our last one, we could call it xn. Let's put a couple of these in here. If that's x0, this would be x1. And the next one, I'm trying to make delta x the same. Doesn't have to be true. And I'll explain why that doesn't have to be true. And we're going to have other ones. But the one before the nth x value would be the n minus 1. So the preceding value to the n uh, is one number smaller than n. <coughs> so let's say that we're going to take the, uh, the area under this curve, and we know that we can add these individual areas together, these skinny little rectangles, if we'll kind of describe how to generate the height of each rectangle and how to generate, so this is our function, y equals f of x. And then our delta x is going to be the same in this case, so I'll go ahead and write that down. That's how wide each rectangle is going to be. So I'm going to intentionally pick the um, right-hand endpoint, which causes the height of the rectangle actually to go above the curve for most of this region. And I would do the same thing here. Now, when I get to my last rectangle, I'm going to take the right-hand endpoint and do that as well. So all the others that are in here, however many there are, and I don't want to put a specific number because I want there to be n, um, if I start with <coughs> the height, if I start with 1 for i, I starts at 1 and goes to n. Then our first value, I'm not going to write all these out, but I'll write a couple of them out. The first one ought to be the f of x1 times delta x. Is that true from that notation? And the next one would be the f of x2 times delta x, and so on. And in fact, the last one would be, if we're using the right-hand endpoint, well, the right-hand endpoint would be the f of xn times delta x. So we've got an approximation 
I'll go ahead and put that out here too. That's an approximation for area. Now, could I accomplish that? Well, let me ask this question. What makes this picture actually do a whole lot better than the way I have diagrammed it? More rectangles, okay? And as we have more rectangles, so I think I wrote this down the other day, more rectangles means that we kind of get, we want n to get larger and larger and larger. n is the number of rectangles. And as we do that, delta x, which is the width of each rectangle, gets smaller and smaller. So we have more rectangles, they're skinnier rectangles. Uh, this ends up being called a Riemann sum. That's what this is. And we're dealing today primarily with what this thing that we're calling a Riemann sum actually is. And eventually, this thing that is approximately the area, as n goes to infinity and delta x goes to zero, then this gives us the exact area. But right now, it's pretty clear that it's not exact. If I've got that much overlap and this much that I'm missing, I mean, it's, it's, it's very inexact. So if I start i at 1, then I'm basically saying I'm taking the right-hand endpoint. Isn't that true? Is that correct? Well, how would I want to rewrite this if instead of taking the right-hand endpoint, I wanted to use the left-hand endpoint? Let's say I'm going to go ahead and do this. f of x sub i times delta x. Now where do I want to start i? Zero. At zero. Good. Now, do I go all the way to n? Well, no, the, the last rectangle, if I'm using the right-hand endpoint, I'd actually use this one, right? Do those both accomplish in kind of the same thing? They're both approximations for the area. And back to this piece right here, if I let n approach infinity, delta x approaches zero, it doesn't really matter which approach you use. You can use this approach or this approach, and they both approach the actual area as n approaches infinity. So it doesn't matter which one you use. If it doesn't matter, I'm going to choose this one every time. So eventually, if n goes to infinity, the side item that happens there is delta x goes to 0. This will get us exact area. This will get us exact area. Fine. I'm going to choose this one. It's just a little bit easier to work with. So, now I'm going to put an equal sign there. I want to find out what the exact area under this curve equals, not what it's approximately equal to. So I'm going to start with this, f of x sub i times delta x from i equals 1 to n, and take the limit as n approaches infinity. So if we have an infinite number of skinny little rectangles, it doesn't matter if they use the left endpoint or the right endpoint. Eventually, we, con we converge on the actual area. So this is a Riemann sum. And it is basically leading us to this thing that we're going to use integral calculus, kind of the other half of calculus, how can we accomplish that same thing that gives us the exact area? Well, when you take a limit of this capital S as n approaches infinity, this Greek letter, sigma, this capital S, actually becomes this S. And I know we haven't used that symbol yet. That's an integral sign. It says we're going to take an antiderivative and we'll tell it where to start and where to stop. Now it becomes a definite integral. And I'm going to put in the argument and in the integrand here exactly the same things that are here. They just look slightly different. So instead of f of x sub i, because we're crawling along to individual x values to generate heights of rectangles, I've got to kind of use the same description, but it's f of x. So that's kind of the height of the entire region. It varies as you go from A to B. 
Here's the region again. If it bothers you that we're using A and B, A is our starting X value and B is our ending X value and we've got a whole bunch of others in here, but we're kind of bypassing this and now going to this as we move into chapter five, section two. This delta X kind of becomes, I guess the best description is a, a dummy variable. It tells us to anti-differentiate with respect to X which if we had a function of x, we're probably going to do that anyway. So this is a definite integral. And we'll forego this approximation process. We can't do it anyway. We can't actually do it if there are an infinite amount of rectangles. It's impossible. So what is it equal to when we do have an infinite amount of rectangles? It's equal to this thing that we've already messed with a little bit, this antiderivative. Now, how do we do that definite integral? We will anti-differentiate So I think, haven't we used for the anti-derivative, we've used little f of x and then once we anti-differentiate we used capital F of x, right? Is that correct? We've used that notation? So we do want to find the anti-derivative and the difference is we're not going to put a plus C on it and then move quickly on to the next problem because we want to get our homework done real quickly because we don't want to spend too much time on it. That's not true, by the way, as I st stated earlier. So we're done with the antiderivative and we now want to evaluate it from A to B. So we take this antiderivative and we evaluate it at B. Some of you have had this part of calculus before and you subtract from that what you get at this antiderivative evaluated at A. You get a number, and that number is the area under the curve. Now, we've got one more step in kind of before we... Um, make this leap where we're actually doing antiderivatives, and we're not going to dwell on it a lot, but I want to at least do one problem all the way through where um, we're actually using this before we get to the antiderivative. So we're going to do one kind of the long way. Just like definition of derivative, you've got that limit definition and you battle that, and I think it has some merit because you understand that a derivative is really a slope. I uh, think this has some merit, but again, I don't want to dwell on it. More often, we're going to use this um, definite integral to find areas. But let's take a look at one before we get there, and we'll check our answer with the definite integral. Um, okay, this is trying to start here pretty simple, but I don't want to start too simply. Let's say our function is 2 plus 3x. So it's not a curve, but uh, we can check our answer. That's one of the reasons. So it's got it's a line that has y-intercept 2 and a slope of 3. And we want to find the area under this function from x equals 1 to x equals 2. Now we can check it because I know this is my units aren't going to correspond but I, I don't want the figure to get too cluttered. So that's what we want. We want the area under that line. It's not a horizontal line. but. Um, and we want to do the problem this way. Without doing integral calculus, and that'll be our, our very next step after this. Before we go any further, I said that earlier that delta x, it doesn't matter that they're all the same width. 
We could have some that are start out skinny, some that are a little wider, some that are really wide. Well, what happens as n approaches infinity? What happens to delta x no matter how fat they are to start with? What happens to all of them? They all get small. So whether they're, you know, start out small, they start out uniform, it doesn't matter. So you could have, you might see this notation, you could have a delta x sub i. They could be different. All the delta x's could be different. Not a big deal, because eventually they're all going to shrink and be zero, so it doesn't matter that they're not uniform. You'll see this in your book. You'll see a star here, x star sub i. Does it matter if you choose the left endpoint or the right endpoint or the middle or some other method to generate the height? No, it doesn't, because eventually we're going to have so many rectangles that it, they're all going to be the same, whether you choose the left endpoint or the right endpoint. If they're practically zero wide, isn't the left endpoint the same as the right endpoint? Right? So it doesn't matter. So if you see a star here, it's saying you choose however you want to choose. It doesn't matter. So these all, it's just going to basically go to some general f of x. Left endpoint and right endpoint are the same. All of the delta x's approach zero, so it doesn't matter how you choose when you begin. All right, in general, on a diagram, and I'm, then I'll, we'll go back to this specific diagram. x0, x1, x2, and so on. When we want the f of x sub i, well, the way I started mine, I'm going to use the right-hand endpoint. So x sub i, how do I end up here? Well, remember, a is our starting point. That's x sub 0. So how do I end up at the ith x value each time as I go? Well, I start at a. Now, when I get to my first one, which is here, here's my first stopping point because I want to use this one to generate the height of the first rectangle. So I want to end up at x1. I start at a, and I add, let me call this a 1, first of all, x sub 1. I start at a, and I add 1 delta x. Does that get me to x1? Is that correct? Now I want to end up at x2. Why did you do the um, Because I'm starting, I want to find out what x sub i is all the time. So I'm kind of seeing if there's a pattern, and there is a pattern. So I want to start at a, and if I want to end up at x1, I'll start at a and add 1 delta x. Now for the next rectangle, I want to start at a. What do I have to add to a to get to my next place where I want to generate the height? I need to start at a and add 2 delta x. To get to x3, I want to start at a and add 3 delta x's. What's the pattern? Right. So if I want to get to the ith x value, if that's actually a word, then I'll start at a, and I will add i delta x's. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. That gets me to, if I want to get to x sub 7, I've got to start at where we begin and add 7 delta x's. So I want to take the f of x sub i. So I'm going to put that thing into the function. So f of x sub i really becomes f of a plus i delta x. All right, I'm going to get away from that diagram. That served its purpose. Let's go back to this one. So the f of x sub i is the f of a plus i delta x times delta x from i equals 1 to n. And when I'm done, the very last thing, we'll take a limit as n approaches infinity. This is in your book, but of, of all the things that I've written thus far today, that's probably the one that is going to carry us through to the next step. 
will we know A in our problem? Well, what's A in this problem? A is 1. So we can put a 1 in there. I, the I values are the things that scroll from 1 to N, so we want to just leave the I. What is delta X? Change in X. Is the change in X, and it's, it's going to be the width of each of our subintervals, right? The width of each of our rectangles. So isn't it, in general, B minus A divided by N? My whole region is B minus A, it's one wide in this diagram, and if I want N rectangles, I better divide it by N. That'll give me each delta X along the way. So in this problem, it's 2 minus 1 over N. But in general, you might kind of frame that and put a star by that as well. That's what delta X is, and I think we've used that already. I think that came up either yesterday or the day before, that delta X is B minus A divided by N. So those things, this formula right here, and the fact that um, delta X is found by taking B minus A over N, we can actually do this problem the so-called long way, which is what we're ready to do right now. And I know some of, some of this is like, how do we relate this back to what we did in the appendix? Why did we look at all that stuff in the appendix? That's about to come in handy. So our A value, now we're going back to this problem. Our A value is 1, and our delta X value is 2 minus 1 over N, which is what? 1 over N, right? So 1 plus I times delta X, our delta X is I over N, excuse me, is 1 over N. And then times delta X, our delta X is 1 over N. Is that now converted to the A's and B's and N's for our given problem? All right, how do we get incorporated in this problem the fact that the top of this region was this line, y equals 2 plus 3x? Now we get that incorporated into this problem because we need to take the f of this. Well, what is the f function that comprises the, the lid, so to speak, the top of this region? We want 2 plus 3 times the x value. So we need to take the f of this well, if the f of x is 2 plus 3 times the x value, we must want 2 plus 3 times this value that we're taking the f of. That's i times 1 over n. I'm going to call that i over n. So there's the f of 1 plus i over n. I put it into this function. Put it in right there. That's what we end up tripling. And then we're going to multiply that by i over n. Now it's starting to look a little bit more like those problems, the latter problems we were looking at in Appendix F. This is a little annoying to have to continue to write this down. But we do that the last step, so there's no way to avoid that. So let's go ahead and distribute the 3 to these pieces. So that'd be 3 times the 1 and 3 times i over n, which is 3i over n. Anytime along the way you want to start putting stuff together, you can start putting stuff together. So the 2 and the 3 can be 5. So when I s distribute the 1 over n, I'll distribute it to this whole thing, which is 5. Gosh, this is already kind of long. I don't know if I like this. This is just way too long. What's five times? I'm kidding, okay? I like this because I want it to go on. I want it to go on to 11 pages, and I want to stay in here for four hours. 
What is 1 over n times 5? Five? 5 over n. And what is 1 over n? If, by the way, if you make an algebra mistake, you'll probably catch it when we get to this stage with the limit. Because our final answer has got to be a number. It's an area under a curve. If we have any n's left in our answer, or any i's left in our answer, something happens somewhere. So if you make an algebra mistake, you'll, you'll be able to go back and catch it. What is 1 over n times 3i over n? 3i over n squared. Is that it? Isn't that it? We took this yeah. times 5 and this times this. So we're, that's it. We can close that out. So it's getting a little easier. We have the summation of a sum. What can we do with the summation of a sum? Separate, Separate them. Separate it into the sum of the summations. And I'm, I'm kind of taking every step since it's our first problem. You can make this process a whole lot more streamlined. And you'll probably want to do that on subsequent problems. So we had the summation of a sum. Now it's the sum of the summations. What things need to stay in the argument to the right of the summation symbol, and what things can we farm out in front? Five. The i's need to stay. Is that correct? Because mm -hmm. yeah. those are the scrolling numbers from 1 to n. Anything else we can bring out in front. So we can bring out front 5 over n. What's that leave? 5. 1. Oh, Leaves 1. Oops. And you could leave the 5 if you want to. What's 5 added to itself n times? That'd be 5n, right? Mm -hmm. But I just like to bring it all out in front. It leaves 1. What can we bring out here, and what do we leave? 3n three. Three three n squared. 3 over n squared. And it leaves i. Okay, now we go back to Appendix F. Don't we have something that we have worked with and developed? What is 1 added to itself n times? Mm -hmm. That's n. Here we've got a 3 over n squared out front. We also, this was one of the three that we kind of captured from Appendix F, said we're going to use it again. Now we need it. What's the sum of i from i equals 1 to n? Mm -hmm. All over 2. Now's the time where you've got a kind of a visual check to see if we've made um, an, a major algebra mistake. What's n times n? n squared. We've got an n squared over an n squared. They better agree in power. If we had an n squared over an n, we're stuck. If we have a, um, I guess we could have an n squared over an n cubed, and we could cure that. But they're going to be the same degree. So 5n over n, that's pretty easy doesn't matter what n is. If n is 5 or 11 or 7 or 17, those are going to, I mean, eventually n is going to approach infinity, but that doesn't matter on the first expression. This one, we've got some stuff that kind of matters. So let's put the stuff that we absolutely know, the 3 in the numerator and the 2 in the denominator. We know those. And then separate from that the stuff that we're going to let approach infinity. This is going to be n squared plus n over n squared. What happens to n squared plus n 
all over n squared as n approaches infinity, which is what we now allow to happen. And that 1n squared over 1n squared, right? Same degree, so it would be the quotient of the lead coefficients. So this approaches 1 as n approaches infinity. So our solution for the exact area under this curve, and we have a way of checking this, this thing that I've circled as n approaches infinity goes to 1. So the area under this curve, it's not a curve, it's a straight line, um, but in general it's going to be a curve, is what? 13 halves. 13 halves? That's the long way. Okay, it's kind of like the definition of the derivative. It's kind of our definition of antiderivative. It at least gives us a way to find exact area under curve. Thank goodness we don't have to do all the problems with the definition of derivative. Also, thank goodness we don't have to do all these problems with this background way of using an antiderivative. Well, we have to know how to do it for the test. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it, it's not going to be one that's a whole lot different from this. Now, let's check this. Oh, you know what? I'm writing on the paper. Sorry, Leonard. Writing on the underneath paper. I've got to have to switch that for you. Just got carried away. Um, <laughs> so here's our region. And this was y equals 2 plus 3x. Is that right? What geometric figure is this region? Trapezoid. All right. So we've got, we've got it ID'd. We know it's a trapezoid. Now the real geometers in the class, what's the area of a trapezoid? Good. One half the sum of the bases times the height. Wow. Several of you said that. That's good. I know. Of course, I knew you were smart. All right, the bases are the parallel sides. So that would be this side and this side. So for this diagram, what would be the length of this first base? <coughs> when x is 1, what is the y value? That's the y value, right? That's 5, isn't it? Yeah. Put 1 into the function. So the first base, the left base of this region is 5. What about when x is 2, what's the right-hand base? 8. And the height, then, is the perpendicular distance between the two bases. So there's the height, which is 1. So there's a half of 13 times 1, which is 13 halves, which is what we got, right? We got that much longer way. You don't have this luxury on a lot of calculus problems. <laughs> calculus problems don't have geometric checks like this. This happens to be a trapezoid, and we have a, a way of getting that. If the region is not a straight line, but the region is something that looks like this, we don't have a nice clean check like we do here. But that's our first example. We had a check, and that's why I use that as an example. So it is going to give you what you're searching for in this kind of problem. It's going to give you the area under the curve. All right, let's get then this example. That's a nice reminder of how I'm not thinking very well. I've covered that up. So let's check it with this. We're going to go from 1 to 2. We already know. We answer we got the first time, the long way, is 13 halves. We checked it with geometry. 13 halves seems to be correct. Let's see if we can do a, uh, an indefinite integral, excuse me, a definite integral, 
and it will give us the same result. So we are supposed to connect this today to antiderivatives, so let's do this problem. So this elongated looking S says that we want to take the antiderivative of everything that follows in the integrand, that's what this is, and this piece in the integrand says we want to anti-differentiate with respect to x. We want to function in terms of x. What has what function in terms of x has two for its derivative? Two x. By the way, I drop this symbol now because we we're finding the antiderivative, so we don't need that symbol anymore. What function in terms of x has three x for its derivative? Three x squared. Good. Three x squared over two. Now, before we got to this point in chapter five, we included some arbitrary constant. On the first example, I'll include that, but you'll see why you don't need to include that. But that's a number, okay? That's some number. And we're going to evaluate from one to two. Now, how do we evaluate from one to two? Plug in two. And once we've plugged in 2 into this antiderivative, we subtract from that what we get when we plug in the lower limit of integration, which is 1. Why do we never need to include the plus c on any other definite one's integral one's problem? Negative, right. So we have c. Whatever this number is here, it's going to be the same number here, right? whatever particular version you pick. If it's 11 here, it's 11 over there. So this constant and this constant are going to knock each other out. So that is unnecessary in a definite integral. So let's just do the arithmetic. We've done the antiderivative. We've evaluated. The rest of it is arithmetic. So there's 4 plus 6. This two. And there's 2 plus 3 halves. So we've got 10 minus <coughs> 7 halves. Is that right? That's 20 halves minus 7 halves is 13 halves. So this definite integral, if we do it properly, will get us the same thing that that long method, or if we have another way of checking with geometry, it's going to get us that same thing as well, hopefully. Okay, let's look at some of this stuff and see what we did that yesterday. Definition of a definite integral. Hopefully that looks familiar right there. That's the guy we dealt with most of class time today. They do have a star there. It's okay. It doesn't matter if you pick the left endpoint, the right endpoint, the middle. It doesn't matter. Delta x, we do want to take the limit. If that limit is not there, it's not equal to this. Remember, these are both equal to the exact area under the curve. So primarily, from this point in the book, we will use this technique. We'll probably do one more example like this, and there is a possibility that something like that could appear on a test. But we're not going to do that a whole heck of a lot. This is a lot easier. and that's the rest of the book that we cover in this class is kind of dealing with that. So if f is a continuous function, I haven't dealt with that yet, but doesn't it make sense that the function ought to be continuous? We don't want any breaks in the curve because that curve is the lid to the region, right? It's the top to the region. So we don't want any holes in the graph. We don't want anything going to infinity. We don't want any of that stuff. We want a continuous function. If it's defined on that entire interval from A to B, we divide the interval into n subintervals. How many? Doesn't matter what you start with. Eventually, what's going to happen to the number of subintervals? It's going to go to infinity. 
So we want an infinite number of skinny little rectangles. Of equal width, that's not necessarily important. That doesn't have to be true, but in this book it is true. So we choose x sub 0 equal to a, and then we find our other sample points along the way, and our last one is x sub n. We've done that a couple times. Choose sample points, left end point, right end point, middle. It doesn't matter how you get your sample points. So the definite integral of this function from a to b is this. So how do we evaluate that? We find the antiderivative evaluate the antiderivative from A to B. I've already written this down once today. And there's how we actually get a number. That number constitutes other things as well, but it constitutes the area under this curve. All right, let's see how these look. If we integrate, this time from B to A, that will end up being the negative of the integral from A to B. Does that make sense? This one, if we, how do we do this one? Don't we take the antiderivative and evaluate it at the upper number minus the antiderivative at the lower number? Isn't that this side? Is that correct? Forget the negative sign, what would this be right here? If I just did the antiderivative and evaluated, wouldn't I put the b in first? Yeah. Are these two equal? Yeah. No, I not until I do mean. this, yeah. right? So we need that negative sign in order for the left side and the right side to be equal. So if you change the, up, the upper and lower limits, what do you do to the number that you get? You mm -hmm. negate it, okay? If you got a positive 45 and you switch the limits of integration and do the problem again, you'll get a negative 45. What's a negative mean anyway? I thought it's, it's supposed under, to be an area. It's under the, it's the, under the, the axis. axis. So. Wait, um, isn't B supposed to be on top? Doesn't matter. I mean, whatever like number the is there. Number? No, it, it's kind of whatever ends up there. We want to start and go left to right. Why do we want to go left to right? Because we want our delta x's to be positive, right? Mm -hmm. We want a positive width and we want a positive height. That gives a positive area. But you can go the other way, it's fine, but you're going to get exactly the opposite sign for your answer. Does this make sense? If you start at A and end at A, that's not a very long journey, is it? <laughs> What's the area under this curve starting in A and ending at A? Yeah. Not a whole lot of area. That would be zero. So the idea of negative area came up. This area up here is positive. This area under the curve, that's what negative area means. It means we're going under the curve. And then as the curve comes back up above the axis, it can be positive again. So it's possible, if you have some symmetry in a curve, to go from A to B, and the positives and the negatives kind of knock each other out and you could have an area net area of zero. That's very possible. That means that either you stopped and started at the same point or you had just as much positive as you had negative. So again, positive area, negative area, positive area. So there's the net area. It's very possible that the net area could be zero. All right, we are at the end of what we can do today. We will pick up from this point tomorrow.